welcoming Dr. Duncan. that very warm introduction and uh, a big thank you to uh, Fabi, Rebecca, and Jen, um, uh, as well as uh, Mary and uh, Christy and everyone who participates in getting these uh, conferences organized. I also want to thank um, uh, Mark and Barry for a great uh, morning session. Every time I listen to you guys speak, I get so excited about um, what we're all, all doing together to, to, to spread this knowledge. Uh, my name is Sarush Zadi. I'm an ENT sleep apnea specialist. I'm fortunate to work with my partner, Sanda uh, Pinkerton, and uh, it's really a big honor to come here and share with you our experience over the last almost two years uh, dealing with uh, ankyloplasia, and I'm excited to share with you guys what we've learned about this topic and, and where we're going with it. So just a little bit of background, I went to Harvard Medical School, uh, and then I went to UCLA where I did my EMT residency, and it's there where I, I uh, appreciated the huge importance of, of sleep and breathing and the actually lack of emphasis on these topics uh, within the ENT uh, residency curriculum. And it's for that reason that I went to Stanford uh, where they had a long tradition of the training in sleep apnea management and we took a really broad focus there where we learned sleep medicine, ENT, dentistry, mind functional sciences, uh, thanks to Dr. Givino, as well as maxillofacial surgery. And this is some of our fellows and people who helped train me during my fellowship year. And really, uh, we're really focused on clinical research and evidence-based medicine, which we'll uh, incorporate into this lecture here. During that year, uh, the focus was on the comprehensive, individualized treatment of snoring and sleep apnea. And so I got exposed to all sorts of kinds of treatment. Nasal surgery, throat surgery, jaw surgery, hypoglossal nerve stimulator, base of tongue reduction, Everything you can imagine, I saw in that, in that one year. But in addition to that, I did a lot of research and we did meta-analyses. We went through the literature together and we dug out everything that's been published on any topic that relates to these issues. And that's really shaped um, uh, what I'm here to talk to you guys about today. So when I went to the fellowship, the be all and end all of treatment is the MMA surgery. And we, we heard a little about this this morning and what a a great and terrific tool it is to help those with the most severe obstructive sleep apnea regain an airway. And the effects of this can be dramatic. And I actually went to fellowship to become an MMA surgeon. This is why I went to fellowship. But in the course of that training, I realized that you can set these patients, you do these big surgeries on them, but it doesn't work all the time. And it's absolutely devastating when you take a patient, you advance both the upper and lower jaws, but they don't feel any better because they still have functional issues. And so these functional issues, in a very simple sense, are due to the tongue and a lack of tone in the tongue. And so we see in this example, a patient who has already had a tongue tie release, but is having a really a weak and low tone tongue that's contributing to her snoring issues. And we're fortunate to be able to help these patients uh, recover from their uh, ankle walking tongue pack and help um, take them to the next level that they need. So this is what we focus on now. This is, this is about uh, at least 75 to 80% of my clinical time. And it's almost exclusively my academic and research time because I've seen uh, what a huge importance and impact this can have on the lives of children and adults and then we're here today to show you some of that and to show you what we're doing in terms of... Can you see any of the things off the wall just sort of... Point your tongue? All right, you, it's, well, it's well known in this group that the tongue should rest at the roof of the mouth to, to uh, maintain optimal tone and function. And this is something that was new to me and started to, until I started taking my functional therapy courses. But what we learn is that when the tongue maintains its tone, it's nice and strong. But when they have the tongue tie condition, what happens is that over time, as they get into their 30s, 40s, and 50s, the muscle loses tone. It undergoes some disuse atrophy. And particularly if they have a posterior tongue tie, the back of the tongue can get weak especially, and it can obstruct the airway. We also learned this morning from, from Barry and Mark that the tongue serves as a scaffold for the maxillary arch. And thank you to Barry for, this, for these great slides that, that 
uh, really help draw the understanding. And as he talked this morning, ideally the, the tongue would serve as a scaffold. And when it's up against the roof of the palate, you'll get this nice, broad, U-shaped arch that he, he was discussing. But when it's That's where myofunctional therapy comes into play, and that's why it's such an honor to be in this room with you, all of our colleagues, who've dedicated, who you guys have dedicated your careers to this kind of practice. And uh, as you guys know, uh, the goals are to uh, promote exclusive nasal breathing, strengthen and tone the muscles of the tongue, promote ideal resting oral posture, and identify compensations uh, that may be inhibiting these functions, as well as parafunctional oral habits. As they also talked about this morning, uh, in this doctor, uh, he referred to Dr. Rogers, and myofunctional therapy actually has a long history. Here's one of the articles from October 1918, almost 100 years ago, when they first mentioned exercises for the development of muscles of the face with a view to increasing their functional activity. So what we're dealing with isn't all that new, but even for this gentleman, for this physician, for this dentist, uh, it took him 50 years. And, and it was almost in 1950, about 30 years later, that he says, in my endeavor to clarify my thesis, I have tried to express this hypothesis in a manner that I have considered to be simple and easy of communication. But thus far, I fear that I have failed to make a very deep and lasting impression upon many of our profession. It is because of this that I appear once more before you to make one more endeavor to stress the value of myofunctional treatment not alone because of the satisfaction of its intelligent application can bring to the orthodontist, but to many benefits it can bring to the growing child. So this was in 1950, and, and we're still dealing with these issues. And one of those reasons that we're dealing with these issues is that we confront a lack of evidence to support this. And that's why it's a real privilege for me with my research background and training to dedicate it to this profession, uh, to bring that level of evidence. And so what I want to leave here at least is to bring an awareness of what is evidence and what do they mean when there's no evidence? Because we have to we have to kind of have an appreciation of that if we're going to come back to the table. So levels of evidence are graded one through five. And I'll and I'll mark this on the slides that you see what is the level of evidence that I'm saying to support my, my statements. Level one evidence is a randomized controlled trial or meta-analysis. This requires randomization and control. This is like doing a study in a petri dish in very idealized setting. These studies are extremely difficult to carry out because it requires you to control for a number of factors. And these studies cannot be performed until you have an understanding of all the variables that go into the problem. These studies are great for confirming ideas, but they're not very good at coming up with new treatments. So when we're watching that autism video, that's a hope and we're trying to, to get there to the next step to help these people, randomized control trials are not the answer to that. We have to get to the grassroots and look on a case-by-case -case basis to develop the evidence. But we can't stop here at the level four and five. We have to push it up. And so level one, we said a randomized control trial, the randomized and controlled. Very difficult to, to, to perform. There are some studies that I'll, that I'll show you guys that are randomized control trials. And these are great for confirming, but not really negating an idea. Just because a random control trial is negative doesn't mean it doesn't work. It, it may not have been completed uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the right setting. Uh, the next one we have is a prospective study. This is when you have a hypothesis, and then you test it moving forward. Okay? That differs from a retrospective study where you go back and look at your data. And the reason for this is the introduction of bias. So bias is your opinions your desires to kind of influence the results. Because all of us here, we want to show that it works. We want to show that we're having good results. But that very effect we can have on our patients may alter our outcomes. And so when they talk about levels of evidence, what they're talking about is how much bias is in this evidence. And if it's done in a petri dish under highly controlled circumstances, it is a high level of objectivity. When they're case series and case reports, there's a lot of expert opinion and, and um, experience that comes in it, the subjective experience. But that still is valuable. But that's where we get our data, and then we can, we can, we can take it to the next step. So in 2015, our group, 
went through the entire literature for every treatment, not only myofunctional therapy. I was a lead author for MMA surgery. I was a distant author on, on myofunctional therapy because I didn't think, I didn't even know what it was when, it, when we were first doing the study. But it turns out that this therapy, there's data, there's meta-analysis, level one data, showing that this can help more than anything for sleep apnea. 50% reduction in adults, 62% in children, improvements to daytime sleepiness and snoring, effective from 3 to 60, prevents relapse, and there's almost no risk to doing myofunctional therapy. So this is the standard, this, this is going to be the new standard of care. And we're very, it's very fortunate and very exciting for us to be able to bring this evidence uh, to Bay to hopefully, hopefully um, move to the next step beyond there's no evidence. There is evidence that myofunctional therapy works. There's also my data my, that myofunctional therapy improves CPAP compliance. And so here's a study in which they took individuals and they subjected them to, to CPAP, myofunctional therapy, and sham myofunctional therapy, which is just massaging the neck. And they're showing here in a randomized control trial that adding myofunctional therapy will improve CPAP. Level 1 evidence, myofunctional therapy helps. And here's, yeah. and here's another level 1 study, randomized control trial, only 30 patients, so it's a small sample size. But if you're able to show something in a small sample size, it's all that much more powerful. They took about 30 patients with, with uh, TMJ issues and they randomized them to groups with no treatment, with occlusal splint, and myofunctional therapy, and they showed that the one randomized to myofunctional therapy did the best, no surprise. So myofunctional therapy works, but now we have a new problem. And that new problem is that when you're doing myofunctional therapy, you oftentimes run into an impedance, and that's the tongue tie. And tongue tie, unfortunately, can interfere with myofunctional therapy. And the level of evidence to support this is poor. It's case series and case reports. That's all we have. That's all we have. Just people's opinions and observations. And so that's why we're here today, first of all, to share with you our experience. But we're here to share our experience. But I encourage you guys uh, that to, to look at levels of evidence when we're talking about a paper. Uh, and the Oxford Centers for Evidence-Based Medicine can really help you kind of narrow down on what is the level of evidence for this. But sometimes there's nothing to support what we're talking about. So a lot of the things that I'll talk about in this lecture, because people ask me, do you have any evidence that I can share with my ENT to show them what you do? And so we're recording this lecture and we'll post it online to share with them. But we'll be very upfront and tell you that oftentimes we have to give advice, but the evidence is flawed. And when that's the case, what we do is we give our advice but we let you know what we're basing our evidence on because it may be biased. And so a lot of the things I'll be talking to you today are based on case reports and case series. And we're dedicating our practice with Sanda to increasing the level of evidence by doing retrospective studies first, then prospective studies, and then we'll get you to the level one evidence that we need. So it's, I'm very fortunate to work with Sanda. Um, it's, it's a big coincidence. It's a big coincidence that I ran into her at a meeting. It was a sleep meeting, and they were talking about all sorts of things. And myofunctional therapy was the last thing on their radar. So it's actually Sanda and Joy who came up with, with and, and, and uh, Sanda actually had a copy of the meta-analysis in her pocket. She pulled it up to show the person, myofunctional therapy is on the map. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm one of the authors on that. And then so we <laughs> immediately connected. And to be honest with you, at that time, I didn't know what it was myofunctional therapy. I had done the research, I had, I had read the papers, I knew it worked, but I didn't have any real life experience. So that's when I partnered with her and uh, got to work with her and uh, it's, she's taken a lot of the courses that you guys out here have put out there and it's for the knowledge that you guys have that she's kind of transmitted to me to tell me what are the pearls and pitfalls of this field, like what are the limitations. And one of the biggest limitations that she introduced me to is that, 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 that the tongue tie, the management and treatment of tongue tie. And so we've been working together for the last year and a half, two years, adults and kids, to kind of put our two sides of the puzzle together. So I come from a research background. I can do surgery. She comes from the functional world. She's taking these courses. You know, she's trained with the, with the AOMT, but she's also uh, working uh, with a lot of you in this audience here to, to, to get her uh, certification. And she has a big thirst for knowledge. And it's by working together and partnering that we've opened an office together.
called the Breathe Institute with our team where we focus exclusively on these issues for number one, patient care, number two, research, and number three, uh, education. And uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. And so the purpose of the lecture today is to talk about diagnosis. When is it a tongue tie? When should you treat it? What's the level of evidence to support treatment in this particular case? We'll talk to you about our protocol. And our protocol requires pre- and post-operative myofunctional therapy in every case. <laughs> Patients fly into us. They're not prepared. You go back home. You get signed up with a myofunctional therapist and come back. Uh, so we'll show you our protocol. Um, in talking with a lot of the members of the audience in terms of how graphic it should be in terms of uh, showing you, the first 60 minutes will be non-graphic, the last 30 minutes will be graphic, and we'll warn you, if you don't want to see how we do the surgery, I'll, I'll let you know before those pictures come up. But we will be showing exactly how we, how we do it. And uh, we'll talk about uh, advances that are necessary for this field. So, tongue tie the obvious, okay? So I hope that most people in the community at large will be able to diagnose these. You'd be surprised at what we see in our clinic. We, you'd be surprised. We see people with 5% tongue range of motion, ADHD, not doing well, and it's incredible how even this can, this can go undiagnosed. Um, but we assume that this is obvious. We also assume that these kind of tongue ties that you guys learn are also obvious tongue ties. Okay? And I defer to uh, some experts in the field when it comes to infant tongue tie. And so Dr. Kotlow has written a terrific book, How to Diagnose These Issues, How to Diagnose These Problems. And for infants, he does a great job demonstrating how to, how to examine it. First of all, you do it from a knee-to-knee -knee position where the child's head is in your lap, not looking into it. And so here he is trying to examine for a posterior tongue tie. He's getting his fingers in there. You can use fingers or a groove director. And he's identifying the posterior tie here as you can see. Okay? And so a big thank you to Dr. Kotlow as well as Dr. Gahiri who are specialized in the management of infant tongue tie. And because there's already so much work going into infant tongue tie, we're focusing our practice on child, adolescent, and adult because that's where the real need is. And that's where the majority of this lecture will, will be dedicated to. So in terms In terms of tongue tie, the existing uh, diagnostic tools are based on the Kotlow free tongue measurement. So if you send a kid to a regular ENT and say, is this kid tongue tie, this is what they're going to use to determine the degree of tongue tiedness. And so what this requires is that your tongue have at least 16 millimeters from the base of attachment to the tip. 16 millimeters, and you're either mild or normal. If you have 8 to 11, it's moderate, 3 to 7 severe, and less than 3 complete. And so here we see one that's 6.5, that's severe. This one would be mild to normal according to this scale, and this one would be normal. And the problem here is that this scale was validated 18 months to 14 years, not more than that. And it was only really for breastfeeding and swallow issues, nothing more than that. So. This becomes a problem because tongue tie, yeah, it does affect infants early in life and young children for swallow and speech issues. But if you miss it, it can develop into underdevelopment of the maxillofacial complex, lead to nose and sinus issues. And if you still miss it, then you get teeth grinding, TMJ issues. And then when they get into their 40s and 50s, they start to snore. And then they get apnea. So how great would it be if we can stop these dominoes from falling in the first place? So the first thing we need is a better way to diagnose this issue. And so here's a six-year-old girl, restless sleep, nighttime awakenings, nightmares, anxiety, social, emotional, behavioral issues. So you know she's having a problem. But you look in her mouth, and you're not sure, is there a tongue tie? And, but it's clear that the structural definition, the Kotlow free tongue length, isn't going to apply in this situation. And so it's for this reason we work with Dr. Audrey Yunwals in fellowship to really understand what and when is it a tongue tie. And so we're, she measured 1,000 people, 1,000 people, within a three-month period so we can understand. 
and we first started with a comprehensive literature review to understand what are all the different ways of measuring tongue tie, and then we start to validate them. And the one that we found that the most relevant was the tongue range of motion ratio. And this is based on uh, Reni Marcusson's Diagnostic Tools Protocol, as well as others that have been published in literature describing this. And I know that a lot of you are familiar with this already as well. And so the idea on how we're going to measure it is we get maximal mouth opening, and we take the ratio of the tongue tip to the tongue tip papilla over the mouth opening. So this is tongue extension as a percentage of maximum vertical opening. How far up can you lift your tongue? And in this case, it's 76%. And we validated that if you can reach up more than 80%, you fall in the top 10 percentile. That's great. If you fall in the 50 to 80, that's average. Most people will be grade 2. And if you're less than 50%, you'll be below average. And if it's less than 25 in the bottom 10 percentile. And the way we did this is tongue to incisive papilla. And that's what's been validated and published. But in our practice uh, with Sandy, we also measure tongue to incisive frame, which is a spot. And we're also measuring, uh, because of Lisa Leahy at a, at a prior conference, and many of you here in the audience, uh, tongue and suction hold cave. Because I know that, and so we're, we're recording these things so that, uh, so that we can push, push the literature forward. And so I just kind of want to say thank you to all of you here for listening and for giving feedback, because we listen to you, because you guys have the experience, and it's our job to take your experience and validate it to the next step. And I see people taking pictures. I welcome you to take pictures. The slides are also available uh, online, but you're absolutely welcome to take pictures or videos. And we're also recording this lecture that we hope to uh, put up online as well. So uh, in terms of how to measure, uh, we measure a the validated scale to the incisive papilla. That's the one we did to the, with 1,000 uh, people. Incisive frame is a spot. If you want to do it there for your, for your patients, go ahead. We're just kind of distinguishing which, which tool that we're, which, which way we're doing it. But either way that you do it, you, we have a scale that we can actually measure. And when you can measure tongue tie, now you can start to do research. But even, so, so and I'm going to show you research that shows that grade 3 and grade 4, as you saw, are below average, poor, and should be treated. If you can't get your tongue up more than 50%, that's a problem. And there's, and there's evidence to show that, and we'll show you. But now what we're charged with is that there are people with grade 2 tongue tie. They have average functioning that still struggle, like this little girl. She's lifting up almost more than 50%, but she's still struggling. What's going on? So she's having a compensation. She's really straining. She's really pulling up the floor of mouth. So we also have to be aware and control for compensations with this functional ankyloglossia. And so here's a little video that explains more on that. Lift up your tongue. Okay. Lift up the tongue to the front two teeth. Okay. So you can see that it looks like a grade two uh, tongue mobility. Can you guys hear this? But really, she's bringing up her entire floor of the mouth. And if we hold her floor of mouth down where it should be and ask her to lift up, you can see she can't get it up. She just cannot get up her tongue. And you see the dimple right here that reflects the side of the frenulum attachment point. Okay, so, so this is what we're, this is the kind of tool that we're using now. Because maybe you can lift up your tongue, but you're using everything you have to do it, and that's not resting oral posture. And so what we see is a lot of people with this kind of, with this kind of profile come with a lot of pain because they're really struggling in their neck and shoulders to kind of get this up. And you can see it. They come with the forward head posture. You put your hand on their neck, and it's tense, 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 tense. You put your finger on the floor of the mouth, and they jump from it being so tense and overworked. And so here's a heat map of an individual that came into our office, and she just brought this as part of her, as part of her workup. And I found it so fascinating that she holds all this tension. So here we are. Uh, we're going to demonstrate in, in our lovely patient a uh, grade 4 compensating to grade uh, 2 tongue tie. So first of all, open up and lift up your mouth, lift up your tongue. So she's able to lift up all the way but she's pulling up her floor of mouth and she's straining a lot with her neck. You can see all this tension in her neck just to lift up the tongue. This is because the tongue, relax now, is physically tethered to the floor of the mouth and she's not able to lift up her tongue mm -mm. with the intrinsic tongue muscles. So she has to use all these muscles in her neck and in her jaws and this is contributing to her chronic uh, jaw pains in this example.
-hmm. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Okay. And so this is how we're taking the diagnosis to a step further. So we see an individual like this, and it looks, it looks fine. It looks like a grade one, but we say it's grade one with extensive strain. And so when you, when you control for the floor of mouth, we actually see that he's not lifting up more than 50%. It's actually grade three. So the way we describe this is it's grade three compensating to grade one, and we're going to treat him to hopefully uh, remove the compensation. Here's another case. He lifts up more than 50%, so he'd be a grade two, but he's actually a grade three, compensating to grade two with extensive strain. Another example. And look at this guy. He's really trying so hard to get it up. And when you look on his tongue, you can see this dimple here, which is the site of the restriction. And how about this little girl with a class three occlusion? I don't even have to look inside her mouth. I know she has a tongue tie. She sticks out her tongue, and it's long as can be, but she's still tied right here. And so what we see a lot of times is that, that the anterior tongue will stretch out, but the back of the tongue is still a problem. It's still held up. And you can oftentimes see a distinction in the fibers from front to back where the, where the tongue tie kind of changes. So we're looking very carefully at these things. Here's another example of the dimple that you see with the tongue tie. And when they curl up only the front of the tongue, that's also a sign. And if you see a CT scan so with the tongue, so this is a CT scan of the airway, as you guys can see the spine. Here's the tongue here. This is the maxilla, and black is, is air. And so the tongue should be up against the palate. So just by looking at this, someone had me look at this. I, I don't think it was this one, maybe another one, like are the adenoids enlarged? And then I look at the tongue, and if I see a low tongue posture, you know, you know the problem that you're dealing with. So we're going to, so how do we treat these issues? So how do I do it in the OR? So here's a case example. Some of you may have seen this case before. Five and a half year old boy, long history of severe tongue tie, affecting his speech and swallowing, slow eater, sucking on objects, frequent throat clearing, nasal drainage, and nasal congestion. So I do it two ways in kids now. Sometimes I do it in the OR. If, if they're under five, I tend to do it in the OR. If they're above five to 15, I can do it in the clinic. But let me demonstrate to you how I do more, more severe cases in the, in the OR. And so you can see the severe tongue tie. It's definitely a grade four. Just pulling a little bit kind of releases it. And one thing that we do differently than most providers is that we go really deep. And we really release the tongue. And so the difference here is, is that we not only go mucosal, but we actually go into the muscle tissue. And it's a partial genial glossectomy, which we'll talk about. And this is actually um, not supported in the literature, they say don't go into the muscle, and other providers won't do this because of the risk of poor wound healing. Okay? And so we want to dispel those myths to show you that you can, under the right circumstances, achieve a release like this to go from a one centimeter to a four centimeter with excellent wound healing, 72 hours, one week, two weeks, eight weeks later. Okay? So this is possible. It's a case report. It's level five, but we'll show you a bunch of them. It'll make it level four evidence that this is possible and achievable. And so you can see minimal scarring. And one of the reasons that we think this happens is because, because we put them in myofunctional therapy, but also because of the use of stitches to close the wound by primary intention healing. And we don't use any cautery because the cautery will burn the tissue causing collateral damage. And so the frenulum was attached there before, and now it's attached here. He really has a large range of motion that he's learned to use. He's doing great now with his thumb, thanks to you. Day of surgery, eight weeks later. Okay. And so how do we do it in the clinic? And uh, thank you to, to Rebecca, actually, uh, and a lot of you out here for encouraging me to try this in the clinic. Uh, and we're having great success. And so uh, what we use is a, is a Versed sedation protocol that we dealt with the pharmacist. And it's here if you choose to use it. But please consult your own pharmacist to come up with your own protocols to use this medication. Um, and we only give it if it's necessary. But the thing we find most effective is uh, veg tails. And now it's time for Silly Songs with Larry. The part of the show where Larry comes out and sings a silly song.
Our curtain opens as Larry, having just finished his morning bath, is searching for his hairbrush. Having no success, Larry cries out, Oh, where is my hairbrush? Oh, where is my hairbrush? Oh, where, 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 oh, Okay, and we have good fun doing them, and we ha we're having really good results. So here's here's uh, here's one we did in the clinic, uh, pre-op, immediately post-op. Here she is two weeks later. Here she is six weeks later. Good healing. And here's a little girl that somebody may work with here. And let's hear about her story with Sunshine how it's affected her life. Hi. What's your name? My name is Danica, and this is Madeline. Hi, Madeline. And, and you guys are here for us to check out yes. her tongue. Yes, her tongue. Because we she had a problem with her tongue. Um, well, mainly is the feeding issues and the weight gain um, issues as well. Um, she's been on a 30-pound weight. Uh, we kind of want her to gain more weight. And then, um, she's also here for tongue-tight issues. And uh, a little bit of background of Madeline. She's kind of... Um, have, um, ever since she was, she didn't have a problem with breastfeeding. She was breastfed for 10 months, but she had a problem with um, more of a solid food. Uh, like she prefer uh, more of a softer food like fish. Uh, whenever she tries to choose any hard food, then she would um, just basically would chew it for like 30 seconds and would try to spit it out. So it was never a concern for us because, you know, we just thought it was, she was just growing. Uh, but now that we saw a professional doctor and special doctor, then um, she is now at the, I believe, at the um, diagnosis of uh, class four, grade four, tongue tied. Hi. All right. Well, let's take a look, Madeline. Open up wide for us. Can you open up, Maddie? Open Can up. you open up? Good. Now stick out your tongue. You Can you stick out your tongue, please? There you, there you go. Okay. And so she's having trouble uh, chewing because she's having trouble moving the food from side to side. She's having trouble um, breathing and also having some speech issues. Is that right? Yes. And she also, um, she normally snores every night uh, when she sleeps and she can only sleep on her left side, can never sleep on a leaf flat. Uh, the other issues that we were having is that she would wake up three to four times um, every day, every night, just to wake up a big gulp of water. And that was one of the things that we were concerned of. Hopefully with this surgery, it can help resolve that with the sleeping problem and also the uh, the asthma and cold that she's been having as the, yeah. Yeah, all right, well, thank so, you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. So on the first day, we've had a, a great improvement. Um, actually, before the surgery, Maddie was doing a lot of myofunctional therapy as well. But before the surgery, she actually was having a hard time chewing her food. That was one of the problems. That's why we came here as well to Dr. Zaki because she would pocket her food all the time. I would take her at least two, uh, one to two minutes for her to swallow um, each uh, bite. But I realized um, on the first day of the surgery, she ate like rice and the like, grilled fish. Um, she ate everything like so fast as if she had no problems at all. Um, and that was like really fascinating for us to see because we've never, we haven't seen that for a long time. Actually, we've never seen her do that. Uh, a lot of other problems that she um, encountered with before the surgery was uh, was that she would always snore when she sleeps or she would have her mouth open. And sometimes you kind of hear a little bit wheezing because she would always get a chronic cold or cough. Um, you know, I noticed the fourth day um, last night, I noticed that she actually slept with her mouth closed, which is really fascinating to me. And I would, you know, turn her to the middle side and normally she would turn right away to the, the left side or the right side. She actually is kept on the middle side, on her back side. So that was really fascinating to see um, the improvements like after just third day after the surgery so we're really pleased with the service that we you know Dr. Zahi had provided us and also you know Ginny was doing her therapist as well so um, really happy with the outcome just the fourth day and the fifth day. She actually has more appetite um, 
you know, like after she ate that fish on the first day, she actually ate a bowl of cereal. Um, I was really shocked because normally she would just eat half of like 50% of the meal that I provide her and now she eats more than 100%. So um, every day it just gets better because she has more appetite every day. And I... <laughs> Wonderful. Um, every day it just gets better because she has more appetite every day. And I... <laughs> Yeah, so another case report case series showing that it's safe and effective for speech and swallow, but also sleep. Uh, the big component of this, however, is the myofunctional therapy. And so thank you to Janine for working on this case. Uh, and let's see how she's doing two months out. In front this time, so we moved you so we can see if we can see the tongue making the beautiful point. So we're coming out and up. There it was. Out. And up, out 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 and up. Out and up. Whoops, little drool. Yeah. I got, I got. You got it. Again, again. Did you catch it? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, and so one of the first things I recommend for any provider doing this is you have to follow up your patients, not just the week of, two weeks out. <laughs> two months and beyond because that's how you're going to learn about your results to see what can you what, what went well what didn't go well how can you do it better so that's the first that's the first standard must follow up your patients must have them work with a myofunctional therapist who's going to engage them and get them to do the exercises uh, to help so when do we intervene okay so we said for so in this case the patient had a grade four tongue tie but do we have evidence should we do it for when we can do it. And so uh, we set to answer this question with Adrian. And so we saw in previous studies, uh, in previous lectures, that you know tongue tie can shape the maxillary arch. But believe it or not, even though it's 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 true and we see it all the time, the level of evidence for this is level four to five, and most orthodontic journals won't recognize that the tongue can influence the jaw, the development of the upper jaw. It's incredible. It's incredible. Um, and so whenever we see something like that, we actually think, uh, we, get re we get really excited because it's a really easy research project that's going to be really high impact. So, he, so uh, we were kind of faced with a situation in which a lot of people are like, there's no relationship absolutely whatsoever between tongue mobility and the maxillofacial development and you should stop telling people to do this. So we did this research paper and thanks to Audrey and she collected 302 data, data points. She measured tongue mobility using the tongue range of motion ratio, which we validated. And so that was the first step, coming up with a way of measuring. And we also used Kotlow's free tongue measurement. She took dental cast dimensions in all different kinds of ways, as well as cephalometric radiographs to kind of find a relationship. What degree of tongue tiedness? How tongue tied do you have to be in order for it to cause a problem? And so for the purpose of this lecture, we'll only talk about a few of the data points that she mentioned, including the tongue range of motion ratio, which we've already gone over, the ratio of the maxillary canine width to arch length, which is a measure of how V or U-shaped your, your, your jaws can be, as well as cephalometric radiographs, in this case, the length of the soft palate. And so uh, thank you again to uh, Barry for these, some of these slides. So we have a Gothic V-shape versus U-shaped arch. And the way we're going to measure this is by taking the, the canine width to arch length, and the smaller numbers you have in this case, the more V-shaped you are, and the bigger numbers you have, the more U-shaped you are. And we also looked at the soft palate length among others. These were the two that were positive. And so we see is when in the, in the distribution of 300 patients in an orthodontic practice, so, uh, majority were grade two. So one limitation is that they're in an orthodontic practice. So the very fact that they're there, they're not a normal population, it's not a normal cohort. But even within the sample, uh, we're seeing uh, a selected few that have grade three and grade four tongue tie. And when you look at how V-shaped they are, okay, the grade ones and twos are very U-shaped, and it's the grade threes and fours that are V-shaped. So this is level three evidence, because the case control study, uh, showing that there's evidence now that if you have grade three or four, this may cause uh, underdevelopment of the maxillary arch 
and we have an indication to do surgery or release. It also shows that uh, grade three and four has a higher propensity for uh, increased length of the soft palate. So there's now level, th level three evidence supporting surgery on grade three and four with the conclusion that restricted tongue mobility is associated with narrow V-shaped maxillary arch. And uh, when the tongue is up, you get U-shaped. When the tongue is down, you get V-shaped, level three evidence. It can change oral facial morphology. We still have a way to go. One important thing to remember is that the maxillary morphology, if you're tongue tie, is that the maxilla, the upper jaw, is an integral component of the sinonasal complex. If you have a high arch palate, high arch palate, you will by definition have a narrow nasal cavity. So you look in this case, low tongue position. We've shown that it's going to cause the high arch palate. But the high arch palate also causes a narrow nasal cavity. So there's simply not enough room for the turbinates and the sinuses to function properly. A small amount of inflammation here will cause the sinuses to black up, back up and block up. And so now we're taking it a step further. We're showing that tongue tie can actually be related to nose and sinus issues. So let's start with a blank slate. Now let's say you have a little kid. And let's say he has a tongue tie. And that this goes undiagnosed for 23 years. You're going to get recurrent sinus infections. You're going to get tightness in the neck and shoulders, TMJ pain, sleep issues, anxiety and depression due to chronic fatigue. I had had um, a number of problems throughout my life that I had um, tried to address with braces, with getting my tonsils removed, with all sorts of uh, treatments. And finally, I went to a dentist uh, in Los Angeles, almost ready to do another round of braces, and he referred me here to. Dr. Zaghi, um, and I did six weeks of myofunctional therapy, um, had a tongue tie release, and then six more weeks, which you know is still continuing. Um, but already I can tell that I can breathe so much easier. My neck before my neck was tensing up. Um, I mean to the point where I could see the tendons, which other people could see the tendons popping out of my neck, um, and that's you know completely gone, basically. Um, I can speak a lot easier, I feel like. I just am more relaxed in general. So, yeah, I would highly recommend the, to anyone who is uh, having trouble diagnosing exactly what is wrong with them, uh, trying uh, and seeing if this is maybe the answer. And so now we're going to talk about why we do it in grade two. So we've shown that grade three and grade four tongue tie is going to cause issues with speech and swallow and sleep and sinus issues. And what about the patients with grade two tongue tie? And so here's a 59 year old, long history of headaches, chronic sinus infection, forward head posture, incomplete phrenectomy. It's not that bad, but, but still bad sleep quality. Hi, my name is Katerina Wittish, and my father's really tongue-tied, can't use his tongue at all, and I had a phrenectomy when I was seven because I was tongue-tied, and it didn't make much difference. My tongue looked sort of normal, but I've had really bad headaches my whole life. I have scoliosis, um, a lot of jaw tension, a lot of problems sleeping, and um, I had been told that perhaps I should go see uh, an oral myofascial specialist, but I hadn't done that. I actually did a, uh, had to do a palate expansion because I had such bad sinus infections all the time and I didn't want to do sinus surgery. And the palate expansion helped, and it helped the headache somewhat, but not entirely. It got rid of the sinus infections, but I still have a very small palate. Um, and eventually after that, I decided I would go see Joy and I would Joy Moeller and I would go have um, an evaluation and she suggested right away when she saw how I was swallowing that many of my issues, including the not sleeping, including the constant headaches and the TMJ, might really change if I had a deeper phrenectomy, that my, that my 
um, adhesions, I don't know what you call them, were, were deeper in and were submucosal and that they had not been uh, disconnected in the first surgery. So I came to see Dr. Zaghi and he agreed that this would make a big difference. And I had a tremendously forward neck when I came to see him. I was sort of like this all the time and lots and lots of tension all the time in the jaw, the back of the head, constant headaches. And um, the experience of the surgery was really amazing for me because I was scared of it because I'd had this botched one when I was seven. Um, and Dr. Zaghi and uh, his assistant were incredibly um, present and, and, and kind and, and informative so that it wasn't so scary to do. The actual procedure was not painful or difficult really at all, but what amazed me during it was we, I had pretty deep, the need to go pretty deep to cut the cords. So what was amazing to me was that the first layer of cords, I didn't feel much and I thought, oh, I'm going to be the one person this doesn't really change. And then the second layer, I started to feel this opening in the back, in the back of my neck in particular where the neck connects to the spine. And, but the third layer, when, when he clipped them, it was like everything in my head and, and, and back opened up. And so now it, you can see that the way that I hold myself is completely different. This would have been impossible before the surgery. So in one second, there was this feeling of, oh, everything opened up. The pressure in my jaw is gone. The pressure in the back of my head is gone. Um, all kinds of possibilities are opening up. I've had a little bit of a dance with my scoliosis because once things started to revise themselves, my dowager's hump, which I had a really big one gone in one second flat, but now the rest of my spine has to adjust to that. So I've had a couple of weeks where things keep coming and going and they're not necessarily so comfortable. However, I seem to be coming to the end of that already, so it's only been a month since my surgery. And mostly just what I feel is this tremendous expansion and uh, a lightness in my head, neck, and jaw that I couldn't have imagined before. I, I, when it happened, I thought, oh, this is what normal people feel like. This is how easy it can be to be in the world. And the fascinating thing, because I work with people's emotions, I'm a somatic therapist, is to notice in myself how from the second that those last cords were clipped, there's a sense of ease in the world for me that wasn't there before. I'm not taking anything quite as seriously I just have a fluidity and a sense of balance that I didn't have when I was always like this. So now there's so much possibility opening up. So I am really, I'm so grateful I've had this surgery. I wish I'd had this deeper one when I was seven and <laughs> didn't have to have this long process. So I would, to any parent who has a child, if your child is struggling with headaches or sleep problems and you know that there's some degree of tongue tiedness there, if you could gift a child with what has just happened for me at the age of almost 60, if you could give it to a young one, it'd be pretty amazing to not spend your life struggling with this tension. And those of us who have spent our life struggling with this tension, to us it's normal. We don't even know there's another possibility, but to find this other possibility now is really, I don't have words for it, I'm so grateful for it. And if you have a child who might have this issue, it, the, the surgery is minimal in, in comparison to the gift you could give them. So I would strongly suggest it. I mean, so she, she had a wonderful result, but what she doesn't talk about is that she also had a craniosacral therapy and fascia therapy. And so that's where a lot of the benefit comes from in this case. Um, because when you're, when you're tongue-tied, uh, there's alterations that occur in your posture, and uh, the fascia system becomes very tight. And the goal is to restore mobility uh, to the system. And, and Valerie will be talking next about these issues. And we're really fortunate to uh, work with her. And thank you for picking up my call every time I, I call you at odd hours to help us in a lot of these cases. Because there's another component that we have to study and learn and understand. Um, that, and, that's, and that's the fascia system here that we'll talk about in the next uh, segment. So I was really excited when I got this result. It was a grade 2 tongue tie with this kind of testimonial. So I sent it to uh, one of my mentors, president of the Sleep Surgery Society, and uh, this is the feedback he had for me. He said, Sarush, I will be honest and say that I think you are better than this, one patient testimonial would suggest. <laughs> Anecdotal experiences like this can form the basis of scientific evaluation, but it's pretty useless in itself. I would suggest, strongly recommend, that you develop an evidence basis with higher quality science than this. 
Yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> and so it's tough to get the stream mentors, but that's why this is so rewarding and so fulfilling to be here with you guys to kind of push to the next level, because we get it. And the, the truth is, is that the standardized, it is shown the randomized control trials are failing, and we have to start at the base here with these expert opinions, which is all of you in here, and case studies like Katarina, who are willing to share their experiences. This is how we're going to generate ideas. Is, yes, there's some bias to this, but this is how you generate the hypothesis that we can put through this workflow of research to establish the causality. And so right now, that was just one case study. So I'll show you a couple more and make it a case series. So here's a 55-year-old female with upper air resistance syndrome. Insomnia, poor sleep, head and neck pain, TMJ pain, cervical neck and shoulder tension, ear pressure, bringing her difficulty swallowing, difficult to sleep on her back, very poor sleep quality. She had grade 2 tongue tie again, right? It's not that bad. Uh, but let's see her experience. You are able to fly now. Oh my god. Listen. <laughs> Let's put the stitches and then we can talk. Okay? Alright. Open. I feel free. I have a capacity to breathe, to take in not just air, <laughs> this sounds really corny, but life <laughs> in a way that I couldn't before. I wish that you had been on before, but when he cut, I felt a release in the back of my neck, in the back of my skull, where my neck and my head meet. And I felt it down through my neck, all the way down through my core. And it was a complete and total release of tension, of pain, of a lifetime of holding on. And I feel completely relaxed. I feel safe. Wow, I feel safe. And I feel comfortable and at ease in my own body and in my own skin in a way I never have before. Thank you to Valerie for supporting her and her postoperative care. Here she is, a pre-op, post-op. So we're dealing with like grade two, one, and we're still getting these results. So it's, so we're dealing with something that's a little bit beyond just mucosal tongue tie. But there's something here that, that deserves more investigation. So to make it a case series, here's one more. Okay, that's hard. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I got to uh, referred to Virginia from my cranial sacral therapist, and. Um, she wasn't sure I actually had an issue, but she's like, you should go see Virginia. Well, she knew you had all of the tension in your neck and your shoulders and that it was unresolvable, that she had to kept, keep adjusting over and over and yeah, over. Yeah, I, I basically see, I joke about it, I'm on maintenance with the cranial sacral therapist. Um, I go to see her every other week and I have been doing this for seven years, wow. you know, but I'm getting better. I was getting better, but she's like, go see Virginia. Um, I go to see Virginia, she's like, you've got a tongue tie, you need to go see Zoggy, but let's start you because you have to strengthen your tongue before you have the work done. Um, so I do the work, I've, which was very hard work because she was so tethered that she was getting jaw issues and oh, neck yes. problems. TMJ, tons of tension. Um, so obviously mine was so bad that I had to have it done in two stages. I've already had the first done. and. The release was so incredible because it took away, in fact, you can still see when I do this, you can see this, this pulling. Before it was all webbing and it, it took it away. The release was so, it took my body at least a week to get used to it. In fact, the next week I kept forgetting what day it was. It was so disorienting to me. 
but it was in a good way. It was like I was on Hawaii. It was the same feeling that I get when I'm in Hawaii, where I forget what day it is. And my body felt, it, it, the, the release, in fact, about an hour after I had the procedure done, I started crying. And it wasn't that I was unhappy, it was like I was happy. It, was, it felt like this huge release and tension had been let go of my body. It was fabulous. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like, this is, I will classify that there's a few things I've done in my life. This is one of the best things I've ever done for my health. Wow. Easy. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And the difference, difference in there. Okay. So three cases, okay. Grade two tongue ties, uh, supported with myofunctional therapy, fascia cranial sacral, and the tongue tie release that goes deep, and we're getting good results, good and safe results. Uh, so here she was pre-op. Here she is post-op, okay. She's still not getting back of her tongue up. Uh, this is her uh, for stage two. And she wanted to go for another one to really get her tongue really free. And so a lot of times, if, uh, we, if we're not sure how deep we can go, because we're still uh, learning and we're still trying to see uh, the limits, uh, we'll do it in two stages. We're also finding if they're really tight, it's better to do the front, let them heal, and then continue to go more, okay? Um, and so uh, here we have a case series, okay? And it's important that I share this with you because the way we do it is not conventional. It's different than what other people do. And I'm about to share that with you. Uh, and I want to give you kind of basis. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, was there any headache on the insurance? And was it supported with doing it twice? Uh, so insurance, uh, uh, we're, we're here to show the, the technique and, and how to do it and how to educate providers. Uh, these ideas, these patients have UARS. UARS is not something that's recognized by insurance companies. It's not even something that... Uh, will come, UARS won't even come up in a regular sleep study. You have to do specialized studies that look at the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic tone, and be really keen on this. So the insurance model is really not um, going to support doing a lot of these things, but we make it work, and we, do, and, uh, we call these tongue tie, and tongue tie gets reimbursed with that, with that ICD code. Uh, so here's our case series. Okay, so how do we do it? Okay, two goals. Number one is restore mobility. Number two is optimize healing. So restore mobility. So we, you got to remove the frenulum, and there's a lot of great tools. We prefer scissors, but whatever tool you use, as, well, as, long, as, well as, you, as long as you know how to use that tool, you can achieve it. The next thing that's a little bit controversial that other providers may not feel comfortable doing is to release the lingual septum as well as the superior myofascial fibers of the genioglossus muscle. So what we're doing, in fact, is we're cutting into this genioglossus muscle, and that's what distinguishes it. Other providers only do a mucosal lingual phrenectomy. They only go into the mucosa, and, the, and especially with the laser. Laser is great at going through the mucosa, but once that cautery or anything when the laser hits the, hits the muscle tissue, that you can get scarring. So that's why we're recommending, if people are going to try this, to try it with the scissors technique, and we'll demonstrate how that's done. Okay? But this is uh, actually a little bit more than just a phrenectomy. It's a partial genioglossectomy that we're doing of the superior fibers, and we'll go more into that in a little bit, okay? The next thing is to uh, optimize healing. So if you're going to use a laser, go ahead, but if you've got to know how to use it. It's a dangerous instrument. You can't, you can't be really haphazard with it. Uh, and so in our practice, we don't, use any, we don't use any cautery whatsoever, just as a point of principle, to show that it's possible to do these without that. And if you get into bleeding, you can use suture ligation to get through it. Um, I strongly believe in primary intention healing, placement of sutures. Um, and we'll talk about primary intention versus secondary intention in the coming slide. But that's a key component as well to the success that we have. You want to prepare the tissues preoperatively with myofunctional therapy at least three to four weeks, ideally maybe closer to two months. Um, the, essential essential. And if they have posture issues, if they have body, neck, you got to get them into physical therapy beforehand. So those are the two things that require patients to establish care with a physical therapist and to work with a myofunctional therapist. And when you come back, uh, we make sure that you have good, um, you're adequately prepared and that you have good uh, tongue jaw dissociation. And we're happy to work with therapists to kind of tell you if, if that are sending us patients to kind of direct them in terms of what we're looking for, and we hope that you get that today, leaving here as well. Uh, and then post-operative oral hygiene, there are a variety of things. I really like the Colgate Peroxyl. Uh, that works great to debride the tissue. Uh, salt water rinses are also good. 
Uh, and then we wait for the stitches to fall out. And when the stitches fall out, we recommend that they gently brush that area to keep it clean. This is what we do. Uh, we have them take it easy for a few days afterwards, so no exercises for the first two days. Really gentle. And the goal is to keep the stitches in place. As long as the stitches are in place, it's going to heal well. When the stitches fall out, then you're going to brush and you can do the therapy. Also, in this technique, it is more painful, and so it will be more difficult for them to do exercises for the first few days, but that's okay because we're putting the stitches. If you don't put the stitches, then you're subjecting it to secondary intention healing. They can't do the therapy. You're at risk of scarring down. So we're about to uh, look at how we do the surgery, and this will get increasingly more graphic. Uh, so we have the intrinsic tongue muscles, superior longitudinal, inferior, and transverse vertical. These control the shape of the tongue. And a shout out to Christy Gatto and her awesome book, through which I used to uh, learn and study. And we highly recommend it. Um, and then there's the extrinsic tongue muscles that control the position of the tongue. So this surgery does not affect this, any of these muscles. So you don't want to get into any of these muscles during the surgery. That's not what this is about. This surgery is about releasing only the superior fibers of the genoglossus muscle. The superior fibers of the genoglossus muscle can hold the tongue down, and it works against the styloglossus, which pulls the tongue up. And it's pretty incredible when you do it in kids, when you just, when you just release this part, the tongue just kind of floats up to the top of the palate because the styloglossus muscle is kicking in, as well as the palatoglossus muscle. And so uh, here's the genioglossus muscle, okay? Triangular muscle with its apex at the mandible, mental synthesis, and it inserts into the base of the tongue, into the body of the tongue, base of the tongue, as well as the hyoid. It has inferior fibers that go downwards. It's got middle fibers that pass backwards to the back of the tongue, and those are kept free. We don't, we don't, we don't go after that during the surgery. What we go after are these superior fibers, the ones that go up and forward. Those are the fibers that we release. And when you release that, then the palatoglossus can pull it up, and you can actually see the genioglossus pull the back of the tongue in, and you also see changes in the hyoid position. And we're also releasing the median fibrous septum, which is the little piece of tissue that goes between the two bellies of the genioglossus muscle. Okay. So now I'm about to show a video. It's about 15 minutes long, and it, and it really is going to show you how we do it. So if you don't want to see, um, turn away. So just. Are you feeling these? Mm -mm. Okay. Go ahead. Open it. Okay, close, close, close. 
to take a pretty off picture. Yeah. Show me a shape. Scissors. I just can't afford it. Q tip. section. Mm -hmm. Take a break. Okay. okay. Excuse me. That's what's wrong. He's been working hard. Mm -hmm, he does. He does. When I said, mm -hmm. Open it. Fall. Yeah. You're gonna fall? Uh, if tongue was gonna fall. Sure. Look at it. See if I can come. I think he's feeling the epi though. Mm -hmm. Very good, close. Okay. What's up? 
Huh? I feel the improvement in swallow. What's that? In swallow is much better. Easier swallow. Mm. Go ahead and describe it if you. It was easier, huh? Before that was. A, the back there cannot touch, but I feel that the roll, I'm able to roll further. I feel warmth in my back shoulder blades. I think it's. You feel a release? A, a, a small warmth in my back shoulder blades. I think they're relaxing. Can you hold the tongue saying? Mm-hmm. Can you assess for me, Sandra? Mm-hmm. Okay. What's going on? I think I was biting my tongue. Okay. So can you stick the tongue again? Like the puppy tongue? Very good. And skinny? Skinny, skinny. This is good. Yep. Okay. Working? Are you still feeling jittery or, or it's just washed over? It much better. Much better. Need some marking here. Stick out your tongue. Yeah, we're just playing with it. Good. Open up. Good. Really good. for you, first up. Looks good, Sandra? Mm -hmm. Good. Because uh, someone observes this doesn't mean that they know how to do it. They have to be a surgeon and taking their own responsibility to have licensing and 
making sure they can handle any complications. If they're going to do this technique, they have to have good suturing technique and be able to suture ligate. So it's not just, if you haven't done any surgery, it's not, it's, don't do this. Yeah, so it's not like I'm training somebody. If someone's a surgeon and they're qualified to do the surgery, we're happy to have them observe us. I'm not somebody that can train somebody to be a surgeon. But if they want to learn how we do it, we're happy to show them how we do it. But I'm not qualified to, to make someone into a surgeon. Okay, so uh, did we do the right thing on this guy, right? You always wonder, did we go too deep? Did we go deep enough? So here it is. Hi, Dr. Zaghi. I wanted to let you know the experience was incredible. Truly one of the most profound experiences that happens in my life. So just a few of the discrepable things I've noticed. Sleep has dramatically improved. I'm dreaming again. Much easier to move air through my nasal cavities. I no longer need the breathe right strips. My nasal valves do not collapse anymore. My top teeth have, for the first time in 20 years, since extraction retraction orthodontics, come forward further of my bottom teeth. Thank you so much for everything. Yeah, so this is incredible, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's with this kind of feedback that we kind of say, okay, we did the right thing, like, let, let's keep going. And we take observers, and here's one of them, uh, Dr. Nakako Uritani. So she's actually, she has a, has a passion for this field of, of figuring out what's the best way of doing tongue tie surgery. So she went to Gahiri and Kotlo, and she flew to Japan to shadow this guy, Mukai. And uh, she came to, she really wanted to see the way we do it. And so she observed us, and I told her, listen, the way we do it is a little bit different, but this is the kind of results that we're getting. And she actually told me, that there's this guy, one person, no one in the U.S. is doing it this way, but there's this guy in Japan who's been doing it this way for about 30 years or so. Yeah, and it, he, she, she, there's actually journals in Japanese, not in the PubMed English literature, Annals of Ankyloglossy with Deviation of Epiglottis and Larynx. Journals in the Japanese literature. And so if you look in the Japanese literature, right, this was in 2000, but it, but it goes back to 1991. But they, that they've been doing this in Japan, it's crazy. And so what they do is they talk about sleep, okay? Um, sleep disorders occur in humans of all ages, you know, talks about what it is. They call tongue tie uh, glossolarynx. And they call it that because it pulls the, high, the epiglottis and hyoid forward. And they don't call it tongue tie, they call it glossolarynx, okay? And then they talk about partial genioglossectomy in such patients. And then correction of glossolarynx or partial genioglossectomy involves connect, cutting the connective tissue of the tongue, including the septum lingual, lingual septum and several frontal bundles of the genioglossus muscle. As a result, the tongue larynx go down and the larynx becomes better aligned with the nasopharynx and the operation leaves those two separate. And uh, they've actually, 1993, I thought we were going to be the first one to bring level 3 evidence, but it's already actually out there, okay? So 38 adult patients with congenital encogalacia, and they called it this. Most patients had angel class 3 malocclusion, which means they had underdevelopment of the upper jaw. They had maxillary deficiency. Irregular alignment of the upper teeth and high, high hard. This is the translation was published in this <laughs> journal, but it's a Japanese journal. I think they meant high arched palate. 50% of the patients in our study had obstructive respiratory failure. I think they're talking about OSA. Their vital capacity increased significantly. So that means the ability for them to take in a breath of air. 1991, 1993, after the operation, the forced expiratory volume, which is a measure of COPD, was not changed. Subjective symptoms of this disease, the, why they came, these patients had stiffness of the shoulders, cold feelings in the extremities, obstructive feeling in the throat, insomnia, fatigue, dry skin, anxiety, irritable nervousness. These improved postoperatively. Objective outcomes included snoring, muscle cramps, difficulty, uh, diff, uh, these issues of, of uh, Muscle snoring, muscle cramps, difficulty playing wind instruments, horses, and inarticulate, uh, incorrect articulation. These mainly approved after the surgery. So 1993, so we're not alone. Yeah. Uh, and, and his say, what are the chances of his palate expanding at his age? So, the, some, so sometimes this does that definitely help as you restore the tongue posture uh, to, to have changes in the occlusion, and we do see that on, on, on occasion a change in the occlusion uh, after this kind of release of my functional therapy. So tongue anatomy, okay? Um, there's blood vessels underneath, the deep lingual artery and vein, and the sublingual glands. So here we have the sublingual uh, ducts right here. And as long as you're above this, you're okay. So that's where we make our clamp. We don't want to injure the caruncle or the ducts here. 
of the sublingual gland. Stay above it, you're safe. That's where you make your first clamp. Make a clamp here, remove it, and then the other thing to be wary of is the lingual nerve. The lingual nerve runs along the side, but as you come closer and closer, it can, it can come towards the tip. And if you cut the lingual nerve here, they can have temporary numbness of the tongue tip. And so I know a lot of people make the big diamond here, right? But if you, with the laser, but if you're going in here and you're making the laser diamond, it's, it's not inconceivable that you might hit the lingual nerve in that case. Uh, so that's why we want to stay in the midline. Uh, here is the hypoglossal nerve, which is the motor nerve. We never injured uh, a motor nerve to the tongue. It's never happened. We've done this almost 300 times. Never have seen that. Uh, the hypoglossal nerve comes from underneath, and it's not, it's not even here. It's not even, it's not, it doesn't run here anatomically at the sucrate bundles of the genioglossus muscle. Uh, what does run is the lingual nerve, which is the branch of the trigeminal nerve, and we're, we're telling you, you to be careful of that. Here again is the lingual nerve here, traversing underneath the surface of the tongue, and you can see how there's these fibers here that if you get a little close to, it can be temporarily numb for, uh, if you injure them. What are the potential risks of doing this procedure that we consent patients for? Number one, uh, this, is, this, is, this is a little bit more painful than just mucosal lingual frenulectomy, right? We're getting to the muscle. It's typical for patients to be pain and sore for three to five days, sometimes more than they expect. We recommend Tylenol, ibuprofen. If patients have a chronic pain disorder, they're already on the borderline for the thresholds for pain, these patients are going to be in pain uh, for some time afterwards. We sometimes offer them narcotics, encourage them to take it easy. Uh, body work, hydration, taking care of yourself, it gets better, it gets better, but they need a, a, lot, a, little, a lot of support. Uh, swelling and inflammation is normal, as a normal process of wound healing, which we'll go over. Mild wound infection we sometimes see. Uh, we try to avoid this with oral hygiene. Uh, we recommend that they brush the wound if they get it, um, and uh, we see good healing after this. Bleeding or bruising is possible, right? If you have bleeding, uh, we have them put a gauze. You can get bruising from underneath. It does happen, but it always resolves. Okay. Uh, numbness of the tongue tip. We talked about the potential complication, uh, potential scarring. Uh, no improvement or worsening of symptoms. So again, so we're, we're we've done almost uh, 300 of these, and we're going to look we're doing retrospective study. We're calling back all our patients and asking them how they did. Um, we have had three patients who've done worse after this out of the 300. And uh, we're trying to study and understand why that is. A lot of the times, as you're doing the surgery, uh, maybe for the wrong, maybe maybe it's not indicated. But what we're seeing is these people already have very narrow airways. So if they have a very narrow airway to start with, and they're going to need something more definitive, this isn't the cure-all and be-all to everything. We still have to pick our patients carefully, make sure it's the right indication that they have the URS, that it is tight, that they have tried other things, and then go for it. So it's not just like we're going we're gonna to release everybody, why not? Uh, so how do you do it with photos? So here's the tongue. We do the phrenectomy. Carefully cut into the fascia fibers of the, of the, of the muscle. Use a Q-tip to release. Until you get adequate mobility, we put stitches in. We use either 3-0 or 4 comic suture, pre-op to post-op, two weeks, two months. Here she is at pre-op and at two months, much improved mobility. Then we talk about wound healing with patients. So in the first hours, it's normal to have a little bit of bleeding. Okay. Then on the order of days, the wound will normally become inflamed. Okay. Inflammation period, one to three days. It'll swell up, it'll be a red, it'll be a tender. This is a normal part of normal wound healing. When the stitches fall out, you develop granulation tissue. If you're healing by primary intention, you get less granulation tissue than if you have secondary intention. The granulation tissue will scar in and contract from one to three weeks. So sometimes they have this incredible release and then it starts to pull in. We reassure patients that after this wound contraction, which is up to the first month, the wound remodels. It relaxes, okay? And so we don't, we don't jump in right away to go back in. You wanna wait two, three, four, five, six months, see how it evolves before you go back in, okay? Because I've seen sometimes people come in and uh, they had a laser, they had a phrenectomy one week and then three weeks again they go back in again. 
No, you want to wait. Just let it settle in, see where things end up, see how the wound remodels, and then go back in. If you go back in too early, you can get, we can get bleeding and you can get other complications you don't want it to. Okay, so pre-op, one week looking good. One month, he contracted in. Nine months, he's released. Okay? So it's normal to have a little bit of contraction one week to one month. Here's an example of how you do it with a laser. This is a lingual, this is a mucosal phrenectomy. Dr. Kotlow is an expert in this. He's using a CO2 laser. He's doing an excellent, he's doing an excellent job here. There is an indication for laser surgery. Um, our preference is to do it our way, but um, we'll talk about the pros and cons. And he doesn't get into the muscle here. He keeps it purely mucosal. He knows what he's doing. That's it. Okay. So laser surgery is much easier. I got this over. Much easier technique, faster, no injections, less risk of bleeding. Okay. But uh, there's secondary wound healing if you make it if you make it make it too large. He kept a small wound in that. So we have a small wound. You'll have a small fiber. But if you make a big diamond, then you're going to have a large scar, and this large scar is at risk of scarring in and uh, contracting. Um, uh, so that, and then, so we don't, I just don't, don't recommend it if you're going to get into the muscle. So lip tie, uh, lip tie is graded one through uh, four based on the attachment of the, of, the, of the lip. If it goes into the papilla, it's a four. If it goes in, uh, just above it, it's a three. If it goes um, well above it, it's a two. And then here's a one. And so what we generally use are the, are the, we're trying to figure out when to do our lip ties. So we're doing class three or four if it goes into the papilla, into the central incisors. If there's oral incompetence that is not benefiting or refractory to therapy. So the therapist says you can't get the lips together, you know, chronically tethered, that, that's an indication. Um, oral incompetence or if the myofunctional therapy of the patient feels that it's very tight. Um, Stanford uh, came up with a, a different grading skill for infants where it's just based on three. So you have the four, but they combine two and three to be a Stanford type two. So Stanford type one is the same as is the Cotlow one, and this is the same as Cotlow four, but this one's changed. Um, lip tie release can be in different ways, and I really want to show you. We're going to go a little bit over, but I appreciate the, the patience because I really want to show you our lip ties as well. Um, two ways of doing it. So we make the cut, put the stitches, cut and stitches, okay? But it goes a little bit beyond that. So let me show you. Here's pre-op. Here's one week later with the stitches. Okay, buckle release. You can go directly into it. But we've come across a really cool new way of doing uh, lip tie, uh, lip and buckle ties. Okay. 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 So we clamp, and I'm, I am going to go a little bit fast on this, but we'll post this online. So we, we inject it. Numb it up with topical first, we clamp it, we make the cut. Okay. Dab, we cut out we cut out the whole thing. And then I do a V to Y closure eventually, where I bring those edges together. But before that, uh, here's a cool way we can do uh, the buckle releases. So this so, is the part where we want to get to the corner there. So here we just do it really bluntly. Can you show the restriction you're trying to resolve? So right in this area. Mm -hmm. Buckle fibers right there. there we go. So we release it. Just make a tunnel. You doing okay? Yeah. Are you okay, sweetie? Yeah. Okay. So this is the part where. We want to get to the corner there, so here we're just doing really bluntly. Can you show the restriction you're trying to resolve? Right in this area. Some buckle fibers yeah. right yep. there. There we go. So we release it, just make a tunnel. You doing okay? Yeah. So we, we create a submucosal tunnel and we can easily just dissect those fibers. And the way we learned to do this is that Santa took a, took a fasc myofascial release course, and we talked to people who do myofascial release releasing okay. with their fingers. So we say, why don't we try unroofing it and just try it with a Q-tip, and it just releases really easily. So you can, you can just go and just release all these, no extra incisions, nothing, no, no scarring. It just releases like butter. It's a simple Q-tip, just kind of push up against it, 
thread it back and forth. It, it work. It works great. And uh, and I'll show you. I know we're a little pressed okay. for time, but you can really feel the difference. Let's see. Okay, and I'll kind of speed it up to show you. So the tension is now relieved. I see a lot a little bit, but I don't feel the tension. So you have a choice. Maybe you want to continue a little more, but I think okay. it's enough. So then we go back and forth until we get it. But I just wanted to kind of introduce that idea of a different way of approaching the buckle tie. Um, stitch it up closed. Okay. Do white closure. Make a nice... Make, so before that, this was attached here. Now you, this tissue all becomes new lip. So the lip actually becomes longer this way. If you just cut it, you lose that opportunity to actually lengthen the lip. Uh, he was so that's why I really like to, to play, put, put the sutures and to do this V to Y lengthening. Very good job. Very good job. So you see there? So, so you have about a one centimeter longer lip right here. So it was attached there. This is all now going to be new lip. This this was used to be attached there. Show the better. Show the better side first. Okay. So I promise to post this online. Right here. Uh -huh. That was the tension. Now a here more? on the on the more. left side. I'll go for it. Inject a Let's bit more. see. You know. Good morning. How are you? I know. I'm sorry. Okay. Let, let him rest a little bit, okay? Mm -hmm. The right side looks good. Yeah. You can, you can see Sandy, do you want to go on the right side? Yeah. Let me show you the, the right side. He's got room. Can you go a little more? Go a little more. I think we can do a little more. Uh -huh. But it's a lot softer, the okay. tension is gone. What are you seeing, Sam? Right, 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 right here. You see here the the buckle tie was really tense. Okay, a little injection here. Hang on with us. You're doing so good, doing so good, and it's a very sensitive area here. So very our sensitive. goal will be to lessen the tension towards the um, the fold. Stretch the side. Let's do the right. Okay, so tunnel here. See? Kind of gently massaging it. Okay. So good. Okay. Okay. And let's try the other side. Yep. Okay. What I'm looking like in this area, you know. The way to go. You okay, bud? Mm -hmm. It's a lot less tension. However, there is still a little bit. But I think I don't feel it as much. Right, right, yeah, this yeah, one, okay. right, right yeah, there. A little more. A little more, right there, between the cuspid and bicuspid. See, you right, see? right, mm -hmm. right there. You can still see it there. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you can still feel the tension. Or hang on with us, okay? Look towards me. Okay. Yeah. He's pushing on his nose, I think. Mm -hmm. I felt it. I feel, I'm feeling it release. You did? Mm -hmm. You're right there. Mm -hmm. Almost to it. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's about it. Stand up. 
You got it? I think it's my limit. Okay, you're almost there. Let's see. The tension is gone. Seriously. Yep. You can why don't you go in the fold and you feel it? There is no tension there anymore. Uh -huh. Even though you see the little flap of tissue, I see a lot, a little bit, but I don't feel the tension. So you have a choice. Maybe you want to continue a little more, but I think it's enough. You go halfway. We're almost done. Okay. Okay. No, oh, he was phenomenal. Very good job. Very good job. You go forward a little bit. Uh, so, are we doing the right thing, right? So we always we always ask ourselves, is this is this a good thing? He's a craniosacral therapist who flew down from is it Washington? Uh, this is a, a couple days later. This is her tongue. This is her lip, and we did the buckle release just like I, I showed in the video. I have to report that my tongue is not only resting on the roof of my mouth. The amazing release of my labial buckle ties is incredibly phenomenal. I have been breathing through my nose during the day and night, which feels incredibly profound. When both the buckle ties were released, I felt a release in my suboccipital muscle. I believe that lip ties are very important to release, not just for breastfeeding, but for breathing. This is coming from a craniosacral therapist. My posture is much more effortless. My breathing is coming from my diaphragm. Spinal twists are much easier. I'm noticing that my eating is much less messy and easier. I'm waking much more refreshed with my lips firmly pressed together. I'm interested to see how yoga... You alright? Okay, close your eyes. What'd you think of that? Oh. Stay right here. Uh, Is that okay? What did it feel like? Uh, did it bother you? No. You sure? Yeah. Okay, just sit there. I think it's important for to uh, first do no harm. So uh, I'll present this. No pictures on this slide, but if you don't know what you're doing with your with your tools, um, you can cause you can cause trouble. Also, if there's no myofunctional therapy, so. Uh, here's a situation where someone went in there, and, and uh, here's the before and here's the after. Okay? Yeah. So you want to be careful. This one breaks my heart, but I feel like I, I have to show it uh, just to say that this is, this is a very sensitive work, especially when it comes to young infants. This case broke my heart when someone sent it to me online. I'm sorry, but I have to share this. This is how the kids started out. It's a tongue tie, small tongue tie. Okay? that you could have got with the scissors like really easily, like that first kid I showed in the, in, the, in the beginning. But look what happened here, huge big diamond, and here he is afterwards, worse, worse than before. Okay? So if you're going to do this, take it seriously. Okay? This is what we do full time, take the courses, learn, understand, work with people. We do now, unfortunately, for better or worse, specialize in revision frenuloplasty. So we see a lot of scarring from prior lasers. We know how to handle these things. We're getting experience in it. Uh, we excise the scar. Um, it, it looks a little yellow when you get in there, and sometimes it can be so deep that Sandy and I look at each other and we're like, wow, they went really deep with this laser. It goes deep, deep, deep sometimes. Um, so we excise it, and we can um, uh, rehabilitate people. 
Um, thank you to Rebecca for this slide. Let me show you my most severe case. This poor guy had a tongue tie, just like that little baby I showed you. But instead of clipping his tongue tie, what they did is they uh, did a keyhole tongue resection. They said that his tongue was too big for his mouth. So they cut out the middle part of his tongue and sutured it together. And then they did a laser phrenectomy, not once, but twice. And this is where he is. Okay? This is, this is important work, guys. Yeah. Okay, we, we, we uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, here you go. So we don't, we, we invest in these people. This is like important work to us. There's nowhere I can send this person, and we know that. This guy came to me for this problem, and this is it. So uh, we told him he may need two or three Good. revisions, my functional therapy, fascia. Here he is uh, after his first release. Okay, so we can rehabilitate people. We wish we don't have to. We don't love doing this work, but it feels like it's necessary, and it's possible to rehabilitate people, okay? Um, okay. Let move your tongue for us side to side. Maybe it's one month. Pulls in a little bit. We went in for another stage. Okay. Okay. Yes. So I'll show you. Move your tongue side to side. So here he is uh, after his second stage, stage two release. Okay. Yeah. They they had these people had stitched his muscles together yeah. as if they were all just one tongue. Much improvement. Yeah. Swallowing. Yeah. Much improvement. Yeah. What's that? Okay. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So it's a difficult case, but we're gonna we have a limited time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep pushing forward. Thank you to Sanda for pushing through with me. Uh, uh, Hi, I am Sandra Balgo Pinkerton and I am a myofunctional therapist working with Dr. Zaghi during the rhinoplasties. And uh, I am here to share with you uh, our post operative instructions. It is normal in the first days to experience minor bloody oozing. However, uh, if that is going to happen, we um, recommend to use the gauze and just to put it under the tongue and to apply pressure. If it happens to be more than just a couple of drops, please contact our office for more information in what to do about it. But please keep in mind, it is really within normal limits to have a little bit of bleeding in the first two days. You'll be provided with 2% uh, viscous lidocaine and uh, gauze applicators. Uh, what we advise you to do it is to soak the gauze into a, a teaspoon of lidocaine and just to apply on the surgical side. Um, in order you know, to keep it nice and clean, just change it as many times as you feel like is necessary. Uh, we strongly recommend to have that gauze uh, inside of your mouth for one to two days, uh, especially during the night time. And with gauze, you can change it as you need it, but just please, uh, please keep in mind, it's very good to have it for the first 24 to 48 hours inside of your mouth at the surgical site. We recommend uh, Tylenol or Ibuprofen and uh, for some people if they prefer Dr. Zaghi will prescribe uh, pain medication. Uh, for the patient taking already pain medication for chronic illness or pain, we do strongly recommend for them to ask us uh, about our uh, in-house outstanding pharmacist which will be able to sort out what kind of medication will suit the best day their needs for this procedure and aftercare. We use uh, dissolvable sutures. Uh, it takes anywhere between 4 to 10 days to dissolve by themselves, so there is no need for you to come back to have them removed. Uh, however, if uh, one of the sutures will come out sooner than 4 days, please don't panic. Uh, it is. Uh, still considered normal and uh, they will come off based on the fact if your tongue is touching the edge of the teeth. The sutures are coming out 
then we encourage you to uh, brush the surgical side using an extra soft toothbrush which we provide in the post care kit. Uh, we recommend rinsing with uh, salty water or alcohol-free mouthwashes as many times as you desire, but anywhere, any after you eat, that's an excellent idea, that's a perfect time. And also a uh, great choice it is using a colloidal silver spray on the surgical side. Myofunctional therapy exercises are extremely important. So please follow your myofunctional therapist uh, advice in terms of exercises and stretches before and after surgery. Uh, we like to recommend waggle flap, waggle spot, um, capes, uh, tongue pops, uh, flat tongue, also known as a puppy tongue, skinny tongue, also known as snake or pointy tongue, and uh, taco. We wish you the best of healing and please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Forward, this is available on our, on our website, the post-operative care. I'll quickly review here. Uh, we say bleeding is normal after the surgery, okay? We reassure them, put a gauze underneath it with some lidocaine. Uh, wound care, we give, them, we give them the viscous lidocaine, we tell them to apply directly on the wound. Um, uh, pain medications, we recommend Tylenol or Ibuprofen. We put sutures on, we warn them the sutures will fall off. Once they fall off, they can use a small toothbrush to gently scrub it off. We recommend uh, oral hygiene with salt water rinses. Um, or uh, I, I really like the Colgate Peroxyl, I'm seeing really good results with that. Uh, myofunctional therapy is essential. Um, I work with a lot of you here, we love to collaborate. You guys are amazing in what you do. You guys are really terrific. It's really a pleasure to work with you. You all have your individual protocols and we want to embrace that. This is our recommendations, but if you have your own, like, uh, like Rebecca has her own protocol, we see great results with you guys. Trust yourselves, trust your intuition. You guys know what you're doing. You guys are investing the time and energy to come here. Um, here are Joy's post-op protocols. These materials are online on the, on the distributed. What's going on? I'm you are you are able to fly now. Oh my god. <laughs> Let's put the stitches and then we can talk. Okay? And it was a complete and total release of tension, of pain, and I feel comfortable and at ease in my own body and in my own skin in a way I never have before. We came on a Friday evening at Dr. Zaghi's beautiful office. Literally, it took no time at all. Uh, Jake was not scared one bit. Four minutes after the surgery, we thought it was gonna be a bloody bloodbath. My son came out lifting his tongue to the top of his roof. They'll show you that picture. And it elated, happy, ecstatic. I had this tension here on my neck. And all of a sudden, I could move my neck, you know, better, you know, more range of motion on my neck. Mm -hmm. And as he kept on clipping, the whole thing, it's amazing. It feels like there were like strings attached to somewhere and they got released. My neck before, my neck was tensing up, um, I mean, to the point where I could see the tendons, other people could see the tendons popping out of my neck and that's, you know, completely gone, basically. Already I can tell that I can breathe so much easier. I can speak a lot easier, I feel like. I just am more relaxed in general. I'm so relieved to be finding answers. I'm thankful for the work that the doctor is doing and excited to get the word out because I feel like there's so many people who are suffering for nothing with the wrong diagnosis. Before, I could never get a, a breath like back into my, the back of my throat into my brain. And now it feels like I can breathe like straight into my brain. It feels like my brain is just like exploding with energy right now. And to come to this place and 
he was able to check his CPAP machine and, and uh, yeah, you know, just have that freedom. And his blood pressure's down. We don't have to be scared about that. I sleep a lot better, and I'm not getting up as much during the night. And, uh, you know, I just, you know, I went in looking like uh, Jack Nicholson, and they came out looking like Tom Cruise. Look at him. <laughs> Mine was so bad that I had to have it done in two stages. I've already had the first done, and the release was so incredible because it took away, in fact, you can still see when I do this, you can see this, this pulling. Before, it was all webbing, and it, it took it away. We came here as well to Dr. Zaki because she would pocket her food all the time. It would take her at least two, uh, one to two minutes for her to swallow uh, each uh, bite. But I realized um, on the first day of the surgery, she ate everything like so fast as if she had no problems at all. Um, and that was like really fascinating for us to see because we've never, we haven't seen that for a long time. Actually, we've never seen her do that. My whole life, I'd wake up, I just feel so tired. My parents got on my case all the time for being late for elementary school. They said, why can't you just wake up? Why can't you just go to school? And it was just, I, I just always have this fatigue. Sleep apnea aggravated a lot of these things that I wouldn't have had if I had treated this earlier. Finally, um, I got the surgery, and those feelings of sadness went away. I just, I just wasn't sad anymore, and I was just happy. I was a lot happier. I feel a lot calmer. The release was so, it took my body at least a week to get used to it. In fact, the next week, I kept forgetting what day it was. It was so disorienting to me, but it was in a good way. It was like I was on Hawaii. It was the same feeling that I get when I'm in Hawaii, where I forget what day it is. Thank you to all of you for creating this forum for us and, and uh, for dedicating yourselves to this. It's really not possible without you guys uh, for, for teaching us. I've learned uh, so much from all of you guys uh, working with you and we still have a long way to go. Um, we are constantly doing research projects and working on the one now with uh, Cynthia Peterson. And if you're interested in, uh, in participating in our research studies, send me an email. We'd love to sign you up uh, just to get a whole bunch of data that we can use to really uh, increase the level of evidence and really help our patients. So thank you, and thank you to Sanda for being here along my side every step of the way.